Uh, yeah, <clears throat> meeting wordt opgenomen. Uh, we're going to start with the amazing uh, Corby, uh, an Australian free fly coach who, uh, for our sakes, uh, got up at six o'clock in the morning and uh, will tell us uh, about uh, free fly safety. Um, curious, I'm really uh, stoked uh, what he's going to tell us. Uh, after him, uh, we then have uh, Martin and Benoit, die ons up to date brengen met trends en veiligheid in uh, wingsuiting. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we have uh, Casey, Casey Pruitt, um, who is just back from uh, videoing in Central America and uh, is going to talk about us about camera flying and safe camera flying. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Mason, the floor is yours. Cool. Hello, guys. I hope everyone's going well. Um, so yeah, let's uh, start off with the screen share. And just let me get this together. Cool. All right, so free fly safety. Um, so some of this stuff, a lot of people will know. So some of it will be a bit general, um, common information and other parts of it probably not so common as well. So all this is just information that I've found over my years of skydiving. Um, so who am I? I guess uh, it's probably a good thing to explain. So I've been in the military when I first started. I started skydiving before the army. So I've been jumping for about 15 years. I guess you can all see the, the write-ups there of different things that I've done. Um, obviously a bunch of stuff in the military, halos, hapos, night drops, water drops, and then civilian stuff, um, base jumping, skydiving, free flying, world records, uh, also traveling overseas. I lived over there and met a bunch of you guys as well um, in all sorts of different countries in Europe and America and stuff like this. So I have a little bit of experience, but I'm always, always open to new information as well. So if people have criticism or tips, hit me up after this as well. Cool. So gear and equipment. <clears throat> so this is some stuff that a lot of people should know. So we're going to go over just PUDs real quick, cutaway handles, riser covers, pilot shoot so there's a lot of good equipment that you can use and some that is probably not the best but still still does work so obviously with puds we can see there's two type or pilot shoots and puds we can see there's the two types of common ones the uh pilot shoot with the the hacky handle and you can see on here if i can you can see how there's no tuck flap just around this corner here it's just that hacky Okay, so when we're free flying and stuff like this, especially if we're sit flying and this uh, this little elastic that holds the pilot chute in the container, if that's really stretched, that can uh, come out, uh, allow the pilot chute to come out and have hezzies and you, depending on how fast you're going, the hezzy may not be good and can rip the whole rig off your back, which I've seen in one of the head up moving jumps uh, recently in one of the videos where the, the, the whole container almost came off the guy's back from having a pilot shoot hesitation, uh, the pilot shoot come out and the uh, main deployed while he was still in free fall going pretty quick. So you can see on the right side, this handle is probably a lot better. And I think a lot more people are using it. So if you're seeing someone getting into free flying, this is what you want to recommend. If you're getting into free flying, I'd recommend this one here for sure a lot more than the other one not to say the other one's wrong it's just we want to make sure that elastic that holds the pilot shoot into the container is in good condition nice and tight you can also change the way you pack your pilot shoot to be a lot harder to create like a kind of like its own stop to come out so when you're pulling it out it's kind of lodged in there a little bit better so it's pilot shoot pod. So as I said, some of this stuff I'm going to go over pretty pretty quick because most of it's common knowledge. So you'll see the cutaway and reserve handles. So these are also common ones that we all should know. So the 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 cutaway is usually a pud, okay, just like this one here. And then the reserve handles can be the D rings. You can also have the D rings for the cutaway handles. I've seen on some some containers. And then we can see the the usual free flow ones just as puds themselves. Now I've done a video on gear and stuff like this on uh, one of my, on my channel and I go through different puds as well. So some puds aren't as 
nice to grip. Um, you really want to have something in the pad so it doesn't rotate and squish and stuff like that. The main reason I'm going over gear and stuff because is because it does have a massive effect on us. If you can see on the right hand side of the, the screen, you'll see where a helmet's going through a uh, with a GoPro is going through the actual D ring. Okay, so I've seen this before where one of my mate Bogues, he showed me this, he was doing a jump and he's gone to do a count and he's gone ready with his head, set and then go. And on the footage, when they slowed it down later on, as he's gone ready, he's actually stuck his head and his camera through someone's reserve handle on the door on the exit. And he's just lucky that the, when he went in and then out, or out and then in, he didn't actually twist his head lock off and pop that reserve. So if he had to pop that reserve the person on the door would have had a, had a premium. So these are, these are some things just to think about. This can happen for wingsuiting, for free flying, for belly, everything like that. But that's another reason to get the, the puds rather than to get the, the D rings, but it is all personal preference. So please um, take it all with a grain of salt, but just, you want to think about the kind of gear you're using for that reason as well. So I personally, prefer puds. Riser covers. So this is a big one. Um, I'm sure everyone's seen that guy doing angles or tracking or any, something like this, or even head down and they've got their risers wrapped around down near their shoulders. And sometimes the riser covers are blown open and they are the risers, uh, the sitting down around their, their, their bicep, kind of their elbow. So, this can happen for a number of reasons. It can happen because either the container they've had, the reserve hasn't been packed properly and it wants to, the riser covers are just blowing open because the packing's not so crash hot. Uh, or the magnets, you can see this one here has two magnets rather than three. Um, so the strength of the magnets and stuff like this as well. Okay, so you really want to have, think about if you're free flying, having at least three magnets, if you can fit them in your, uh, in your, your riser covers otherwise the tuck flaps a lot of the speed guys are using tuck flaps from what i'm aware of um i had on a jump when i was doing speed skydiving at the worlds over in chicago one year i think i was doing about 450 and i had a tight suit on I'm going out flying real quick I felt this bang and i thought oh, i must have hit my max speed or something so i accelerated through it and i felt this flapping on my leg and in my head and i thought oh yeah i must have been going so fast that i blew a hole in the bottom of my suit how good is that and i thought geez i'm a bit cocky to think that what's going on and i looked down and there's my toggle wrapped around my leg while i'm doing 450k an hour and it's spinning around in circles tied itself off it's because my riser covers blew open I had three magnets in it and it was regularly happening. I thought my, my rig was packed good. It was a brand new rig. And it's just some, some of the ones, they just keep blowing open. So they did stick, they have stuck three magnets in it because of these, because of this, um, but they don't always work. A lot of the tuck flaps, they generally do work. I haven't really seen too much of an issue as long as the reserve, the, the reserve is packed properly. So it's nice and slim line. You can't get any air heading in at certain speeds, which blows that open. So if you're going to go fast, I recommend tuck flaps. If you're going not so quick, but a little bit quicker, magnets are fine. Otherwise, just, just keep it, keep an eye on it, hey? Because um, they can be an issue. No one, no one wants to be jumping around with, with risers flying around between their elbows, especially if you're on your back looking at someone or you look, look over as a leader and, and all of a sudden two of your students, which I had on the weekend, the same thing rises down here and it was just regular. It just gets scary, especially for people diving down after them. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, pilot shoots. All right. So this is another one that I have found makes a bit of a difference. So I choose for me, you can see the two systems here. You can see the, the common one over here with the curve pin. Okay, and the, the, the throwaway pilot shoot, right? And then we can see the other one over here, okay, is the pullout system. So I have switched to a pullout system for the pure reason of uh, 
this straight pin you'll see on the left left picture i actually pack my pin under the flap okay so i don't put this this pin i don't put this pin on the top i tuck it under this and that way it's it's covered and it's a lot safer so i'm, I'm going to have less chance of someone hitting me as a premi um, give me a premi on the door or scraping the rigs or anything like this because the majority of jumps that i do as a coach is with people around me i have a lot of newer people i have a lot of uh bigger groups and not all the time people are paying attention to what their rigs are doing uh moving in the plane they're scraping stuff i've seen a lot of unfortunately a bit of premies on the door from people just scraping and not paying attention to their parachute so this this helps that little bit to make that a little bit more more safe and secure i don't think i've got my uh, my parachutes at the, at the dz at the moment so it does make it a bit safer and secure with less chance of knocking that pin out um it's personal preference because to do this your pilot shoot, I don't know if everyone's familiar with these, your pilot shoot is actually placed inside the container down here. So there's less chance for being knocked. There's not in the, the hack as well. So for speed skydiving as well, if you're getting into this, I highly recommend getting a pullout system. And that way, if you do have a floating handle, the handle comes out, the pilot shoot's not gonna come out and give you a premium as well. Um, these ones do work as well. Most people are, are using the the um, usual curve pin I used it for many years. It's not an issue. I just choose to go with the pullout system purely for that safety, that extra safety. Okay, um, just for speeds, high speeds, it's a lot less likely that it's going to come out. If you're jumping in big groups, it's a lot less likely that it's going to um, scrape against the the plane, other people, stuff like that. Wing suiting, do not use it because uh yeah you, you good luck trying to deploy the uh pilot shoot past the wingsuit because as you i don't know if everyone can see you can see this little handle here this little piece of uh of uh cord i guess cordage that's what's pulling the pilot shoot out so you do have some sort of a gap between where that pilot shoot is you have to physically pull it out and let that that air drag it out. If you don't physically pull it out, if it's caught in that verbal the, the the body or the wingsuit, it can go back onto your body, cause a horseshoe and all sorts of stuff. So this was originally built before the curve pin. It's just a older method that's been kind of brought back in because it can be a bit safer, but it also can cause other problems as well. So if you do go to get this, talk to your rigger, talk to experienced people because you want to try and find out all the different pros and cons because the curve pin definitely has a lot of pros as well as that pin. So do not just go up. Oh, he said this, I'm going to go with that. All right. So sub disciplines, these are all things that I'm sure a lot of people are going to be knowing from skydiving itself. So we have uh, vertical tracking angles and tracking are kind of similar we can call it trace we can call it angles we can call it whatever you want there's all sorts of names freestyle artistic dynamic and speed and obviously freestyle artistic and dynamic they have similar fall rates and similar stuff like this and then obviously speed skydiving so vertical skydiving um safety wise with vertical skydiving obviously it's smart to start with small groups um we always want to start with just a like solos for learning to sit is fine but from doing tunnel now a lot and teaching a lot of beginners, one of the things that I do find, I personally think it's best to try and learn it as much as you can in a group of two, at least. That way you have some sort of a reference to know if one person is drifting back or you're drifting back, and then you can work to a center point. Because if anyone's been in the tunnel here, you know how quickly by just moving one hand, how quick you can fly from one side of the tunnel straight to the other. It takes about a second, if that. So if you take one second just to move your hand from just 10 centimeters, if that, imagine for a minute and you're accidentally spilling air in one direction that you don't realize you can be cruising up jump run very, very easy. So I find having that reference of, of, an, of, a, of another individual, it really helps. So obviously using working in two ways, going to four ways five ways all sorts of stuff like this okay so vertical skydives are anything that's meant to be going straight down 
rather than across the sky or anything like this. They could be in varying speeds. I'd probably say in a picture to the left, um, this one here, they're going to be going a bit slower compared to the one on the right, okay? This is because orientation of head up or sit flying uh, does present a little bit more drag compared to head down. But in saying that, you can also fly head down with a sit flyer. So it's just changing your speeds, okay? It really depends on what kind of skydive you're doing, who's on it, the heavy body weights, all this kind of stuff. So generally, we're, I'm gonna, I'll be referencing back to this, so I'm telling you all about this soon. So I'm really thinking about the speeds, okay? So you can change them. Tracking angles, so moving across the sky. Um, something to watch out with this is obviously the changing of speeds and uh, the corking. So corking is a big factor in this. Corking is when you um, essentially can't keep up with the group and you change your fall rate, fall rate really quickly. So this happens in, in the vertical flying as well. So if we see old mate here, he's in this position relative to the ground, same as everyone else. Now, if all of a sudden he changes his body position to this shape, he's going to go this direction very quickly, okay? If he goes that direction very quickly, there's a chance that he may hit someone else. So the goal of not corking is trying to return to the same orientation as everyone else as quick as possible on an angle. Free flying, let's see if I can go back. No, don't know how to go back at the moment. Free flying. You want to kind of keep up in a ball angles you want to try and return to that as quick as possible because if you if you just go into a ball either way you're going to cork you're going to stop your your forwards movement you're going to stop that motion that you're keeping up with a whole group and you'll have a high chance of hitting another person we had an incident like this in um fiji and it wasn't a corking one incident it was on track off so the group was flying I uh, don't know if you can all see my hands. I'm very small at the moment. And when you're you're tracking off, you're meant to peel off slowly. So you keep that forwards direction and then you slowly turn. It's very similar to wingsuiting as well. And the person turned sharply very quickly and someone was still diving in, say, this position here. So they were diving behind and this person turned very sharply. And they hit each other. He hit her in the head, broke her femur and snapped it and she broke a femur in free fall open the parachute obviously that was painful and then she smashed it into the ground as well this is in fiji she had uh there was you have to fly back to australia for medical assistance from there there was no insurance she didn't have insurance or anything either so a lot of pain now having to get a chopper flight to the mainland now having to hop on a plane to go back to australia have surgery all the time of not having the leg brace. So depending on where you are as well, the accident that happens can have some pretty bad results. So either way, the main thing I'm trying to talk about is keep that, that speed going, okay? Obviously you can tell with this angle that these guys are on in this one and the pitch they're on is a little bit different to the beginner one or the beginner tracking one, which is down here, okay? So it all does depend, but the same in theory, uh, the same method in theory exists. Keep that forward speed going. Try to return as much as you can to that same angle and same pitch as everyone else. Obviously, if you're beginning, it's going to be pretty hard. Um, if you're not so safe uh, or not so confident in it, go to smaller groups. Yeah, less chance of having accidents or anything like this. So for break-offs, usually with tracking and angles, we're looking at breaking off at around 5,000 feet, anywhere from four and a half, to five and a half, usually I think five grand is the, the typical that we've been doing in Australia at the moment. So it may be different in, in Europe now, I'm not sure, but usually about five grand. Now in saying that, you can see on the right screen side of the screen is this one, head up moving, okay? So we have found in Australia with a couple of the jumps that we've been doing, it's really important to try and break off a little bit earlier. So. We have been breaking off anywhere from five and a half to 6,000. The reason for this is you have more time to clear your space. Uh, you're falling generally most of the time, not all the time, at a steeper fall rate because it's a lot harder to go flatter in head up moving. And another thing that I've introduced on these jumps is to not on break off, hear your dinner and everyone transitions at once and then tracks off. 
I really encourage people to be head up flying. They hear the dinner at 6,000 or five and a half. They do the exact same break off as they would on a angle jump and they turn and they peel out. So now they're peeling out in the head up tracking. Once they've cleared their air, then transition and then go. I've seen too many times where people will be going head up track and they turn and all of a sudden someone clips them or they're, they're not aware of where the rest of the group is and stuff like this. So everyone's trying to do a transition at once. So really think about trying to track off and clear your air first and then continue tracking and then pitching after that. So that's a, a big one that I have seen recently. Um, we have had on a couple angle camp, uh, head up moving camps that we did in Australia is um, on the foot fetish on, on the same day, we were doing eight way groups and one of the person people got left behind. They've tracked off. Everyone thought they were clear. After they thought they were clear, went to pitch and they just missed the canopy. And they've just gone over the front of them. And this is because the person who was behind the group thought, okay, there's the group. I'm good. I can just roll around transition and, and pitch my pilot shoot. And then I'm going to be safe and fine. And lo and behold, the person who was following decided, okay, I reckon I can just go backwards and not peel out from the group. And because the two choices of that, instead of peeling out like they normally would on a normal tracking jump or angle jump uh they almost went through each other's parachute and it happened twice on the same day in crystal clear skies so it can happen at any time with any experience so really really try as much as you can if you're doing head up moving jumps to uh keep to that same method of peeling off and flying in that same direction as you normally would right so that's tracking and angles Speed skydiving, speed skydiving. So with speed skydiving, you're hopefully going at a lot faster speeds. And this isn't always the case. When people are beginning speed skydiving, a lot of them are actually still tracking through the sky rather than going very steep. So it's really important to pick your heading as you get off the plane, turn 90 degrees to jump run, and then go into the, the, the dive because you, all of a sudden, if you lose that heading and you start tracking up jump run, you could track up very quickly, extremely quickly. And it's not necessarily that you're going to hit someone if you're falling at a faster rate. It's you may open at your normal height, be flying back to the drop zone, and all of a sudden, people start dropping on top of you and you've flown back to the droppy, even if you open in the right place. But because you've opened so quick, so much quicker than everyone else, their drift has now put them over the top of you, which we'll continue with that in a second with, with our spotting and stuff like this. So it's really important to try and pick that, that heading, fly off jump run, and then open and then stay there watching everyone else fall. This can be a bit trickier with uh, depending on where you're getting out and different drop zones have different rules on where speed gets out. Some of them have, they have to go earlier. Some of them have to say they have to go at the end and some drop zones are safe no speed at all because it's too difficult cool so speed can have various changes they can go from 200k an hour all the way up to 500 um just depends on the skill level really so that's where the riser covers come in a lot more so pay attention to those ones dynamic flying um so this is a big one with dynamic a lot of people doing a lot of tunnel now, a lot of people doing low speed, a lot of people doing high speed dynamic. And this is where it can get really confusing of where do you put dynamic out in the setup of the, of the exit order. Some people think we, we need to go out last because we're falling, we're, we're free flying. And then I say, sometimes it depends because if these people are doing low speed, they can fly at the same foray as a belly formation. So they're gonna drift the exact same as belly so should they get out last or should they get out first it really depends on what kind of speeds you're falling at okay so dynamic can be tricky dynamics anything that's carving doing layouts anything that's not moving in a straight line or falling straight down cool freestyle freestyle is part of dynamic okay so it's a, a long long lasting subdiscipline of free fly um same incidences and stuff can occur with as the dynamic one a lot of fall rate changes a lot of moving around the sky cool so we need to be really aware of that when we're climbing up to the exit of putting in this in the stack up and giving them enough space that if they do move they have enough room to move same with the artistic so 
same with the camera flies and stuff like that. It's very same as free fly, uh, sorry, the freestyle. Cool. Um, so progressing to larger groups, going from small to large. This is something I've been trying to wrap my brain around for a long time with events. So I'll have a lot of people trying to go from three ways to eight ways, 12 ways. I ask, can you do head down? They say, yes, I can. But their version of head down is a little bit different than my version of head down. So head down in my eyes or any discipline, if you can do that fully competent, then you can do it. If you're only just holding the position or just kind of trying to settle in, then you can't necessarily do that position. If you can come up, take a dot comfortably without corking, without wobbling, then you're classed in my eyes as you can do it. Okay. Just because you can do a three-way doesn't necessarily mean you should do a 12-way. So participants should be competent in, in the set discipline before moving on to larger groups within that discipline. So I three ways, do five ways, do eight ways, do 12 ways. Just because you can be competent at doing three ways doesn't mean you should do a five way, do one jump five way, then move to eight way. This is like when I was in Europe, not Europe, um, KL Tower, I could do a double gainer, done, sorry, a single gainer off the, off the building, done heaps of them. Went to do a double, done one double, thought I nailed it, I'm ready for a triple. Went to do a triple, accidentally done four, couldn't get off my side, almost went in, pitched my pilot shoot. It was the biggest shock that I had almost almost died. So tells me I should have been more competent in doing doubles before I went to do triples. I stopped doing gainers that day because it was probably a stupid idea. So obviously before combining disciplines, participants should be fully competent in each discipline choice. So it means if you can do a head down three way, or sorry, head down five way jump, and you've only done a carving jump in a two way, you probably shouldn't do a carving jump and a head down jump a dynamic one. So doing docks head down, then move to carving before you have comfortably done a five way carving jump or something like this. So really think about the combining groups and stuff like that. So importance of spotting. So drift, drift is a big one. So when you rock up to a drop zone, you should see something similar to this picture on the right like this. So this will tell you, I don't think the, uh, the speeds are good, to, uh, the heights are good. So this is 14,000 feet, 1,000 uh, 1, feet, and it's gonna tell you the winds all the way up. The reason this is important is because each group drifts differently. Bellies drift more, so they're falling slower. Uh, free flies are going faster. Angles can go similar to belly, if not similar to free fly, and dynamic is the same. Okay, so each group, depending on how much presentation you're having, will drift more or less. Really want to understand all the winds because if the winds are coming from different angles, it depends on where you're going to drift drift to. Okay, so obviously communication between load. If you don't have communication between I'm doing head down, I'm doing angles, I'm doing belly you may get out in different orders and you may drift over the top of each other. Okay, so if we move to the next slide, you'll see a jump run. So this is Byron DZ, okay? So say we have a jump run going like this, okay? All the winds are coming from this direction. If that's the case, say they're doing a the whole way, this group, in free fall is going to drift something to about here when they open. Okay, so it's gonna get pushed this direction. So if they're going to get pushed around it here, all right, now they're opening in this area. One, two, three. If we get out and we're going to do a tracking, tracking group and we track this way from this one, these groups may drift over the top of us. So it's really important if you're getting out tracking, you drift track into wind. That way, when the whole groups get out, they're all going to drift in the same direction. So this is where previously I stated about opening and flying back to the drop zone. Okay, so if they open the jump runs here, boom, tracking this way, they're opening here. As they're flying back to the drop zone, this group may drift over the top of them and all of a sudden canopies start opening right where you are. If you get blamed, you went up jump run, you went this, blah, blah, blah. 
It's really important to know where the winds are coming from up top because you need to track into the wind so that everyone's drifting together. I see that happen a lot if people just go, I'm going left, I'm going right, and they don't understand what's happening with the winds. Okay, so winds can be different from all different heights. It's like currents uh, with the ocean, stuff like this. So it's the same with jump runs with... Uh, some DZs might be jump flying downwind, okay? So if the wind is coming from this way up high, wind's coming from this way down low, all right? You might have a fast tailwind. If the, the wind changes at 5,000 feet, should you put belly out first or free fly out first? Because some people will go, belly always goes first. But if you have a tailwind up top, and we put the belly out first, they're going to drift more than the free fly. So they may actually end up drifting into the free fly group because you have a tailwind and they should actually essentially get out last. So paying attention to what the winds are doing and what direction they're coming from up high is extremely important when you start doing tracking jumps, dynamic jumps, free fly jumps, because where you drift and how much wind there is and which direction you're getting pushed in depends on where you open, depends on the traffic. It's not just about where you open, it's about the traffic of how you're flying back to the drop zone as well too, just because it depends on all the wind. So it's so many things affected. I can do a whole nother seminar just in this itself. So try and have an RCDZ with that. If, it, if you struggle, I've got another thing on um, my channel as well, explaining drift and jump runs and how to figure all this kind of stuff out. Because as I said, I can go into this in depth massively for a very, very, very long time. So take that into consideration, especially if there's crosswind jump runs, um, all sorts of things like that. Just knowing that belly falls slower, free fly falls quicker, dynamic, depending on what you're doing can vary so much so talk to the people communication on the load is probably one of the most important things that you can do same with tracking same with all these kind of things so communication and knowledge of the area that's around you is extremely important that one i'm probably sure i got questions on um whoop. cool so students so when people are starting to learn free flying um it's really important to know their level Okay, this keeps them safe at aids and giving them the correct education at aids in the groups, uh, grouping them together with similar levels. Okay, so knowing your level is not always the easiest thing. Um, it can be also pretty tricky for a coach when they're like, what can you do? I can, I can sit fly. Uh, does that mean you've tried sit flying before or you have sit flying? Um, can you jump in bigger groups? It's like, or smaller groups. So really trying to ask specific questions to test their ability and to understand what their knowledge is. Okay, uh, I have that in, in my, my camps. Uh, many, many, many times I've been unfortunately wrong with what someone's skill level was because what are, their interpretation of a certain discipline of what they could do is different to mine. I had this when I was first learning to do head down. I was watching the uh, fly boys. I had about 20 jumps and I thought, that looks pretty easy. I went out, done a bunch of head down solos, and then I invited my mate to, to come skydive with me. And I said, Oh, can you, you have way more jumps than me? Like, can you, uh, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do head down. He's like, How do you get into it? Just like roll sideways, hold it, you know, like pizzas. And I'm good. And he's like, All right. So we got out. He's like, How do you get out? On your belly, got out of my belly, cartwheeled into it, and I just flapped around and then took off. Corked again, popped around and took off. And I got down, I thought it was the best jump in the world. I'm like, yeah, man, that was sick. And he just walks up, goes, you're never, ever allowed to do that again. And just banned me. I didn't have a clue what it was. He showed me the footage, the wobble. I'm like, yeah, look, that's, that's where I went head down. I nailed it. I was really good. He said, no, nah, that was shocking. You almost killed us big time. It wasn't until 100 or 200 jumps later on that I actually realized the danger of what I did. I went back and watched it a couple of years ago. And yeah, it was interesting, funny, to be honest as well, just to see how uh, yeah, innocent people can be and you don't know it can happen to everyone. What your interpretation of being able to do something may be different to others. And it's a simple, simple mistake. So really questioning them about what level they're at is really important because what someone thinks they can do it might not necessarily be the same as you. And that could be the difference between getting someone on the jump 
that's going to kill everyone and getting someone on the jump that's actually safe and able to aid to to the progression of everyone as well and everyone can make a mistake everyone can so this is the questionnaire of just a, a random thing that i've created for uh my angles group in for people trying to attend to do angles on uh, the dd camps and it's a bit of a weird kind of uh questionnaire for them to fill out it's just so i can kind of judge exactly what their level is so a lot of people go wow these are really strange questions but for me i can understand it's like tick what you can do tracking and angles and dynamic in a small group and flat yep they can do that someone might go can you do tracking yeah i can do it in a small group and flat yep for sure within one meter or no i can't do it within one meter so well that means you're in this group okay so you have to kind of pry a little bit more than just asking them a blatant question they need to be a bit more specific so can you do steep returns yeah, yeah for sure it's like in a small group or bigger or so these are some questions just have have a think about those maybe you need to change the way you just structure what your definition of achieving a certain discipline or topic is compared to what the generalized uh question is oh missing a lot of ah, there we go yep. cool i just looked at the uh questions i hadn't even seen them so elephant in the room what is exactly dynamic um yeah carving layouts moving jumps in multiple directions okay is dynamic the same as tunnel on the skype that's a hard question too yes no probably not um it can be if you're doing faster stuff it really depends on your interpretation of what speed you're doing what your skill level is when is it class that i can do dynamic in a tunnel so this is a big one a lot of people say i'm going to go do dynamic if you're still being in my eyes if you're still being spotted and held on to with a grip you can't do dynamic yet Okay, so you probably shouldn't, if you're being held onto in a tunnel, you probably should not go and do dynamic in the sky. You can still use these techniques of carving in the tunnel to aid with learning how to do tracking. You can aid, use outface carving to aid with belly tracking. You can use a lot of these tools to help with skydiving, but I wouldn't necessarily say you can do dynamic until you can be released off the grip for for everything okay so when is it okay to start dynamic in the sky probably then probably when you're competent doing this you can learn how to carve in the sky without doing the tunnel i did you can learn how to do layouts in the sky without doing tunnel but do these in smaller groups the same as what i said before if you're going to do it two ways stick to two ways if once you've done four ways you should have been fully competent in two ways and three ways of moving and carving try not to learn layouts or something in groups of five if you've never done it before so there's just some simple processes you want to try and think about with that. If you see other people doing the same thing, there's ways to pull them up. Just be polite. Maybe tell them a story of an incident that happened to you of, of why you didn't do it. Hey, I didn't do this because my mate got hurt or because I got hurt or something like that. Trying to relate to them is uh, extremely important and really, really, really helps. Uh, so Tunnel to Sky, common incidences. So one is as i said before the drift that makes a big difference people going in they've done a bit of carving with a coach in the tunnel a couple of layouts stuff like that and then they go to go skydiving and all of a sudden they don't know what drift they're doing and they're flying straight up jump run uh overload's a big one as well they're used to small small spaces in the in the tunnel yet in the sky it's so much bigger there's a lot more happening so they can get quite stressed and quite overloaded with that i have a thing called first time i face if you see someone with their eyes through the roof they're probably very much overloaded you don't need to really tell them what to do you probably just need to give them a relax your eyes signal they're going to laugh at you and all of a sudden they're going to become aware as well so that means building awareness okay so i really want to try and build the awareness of what they're doing before you start trying to change what they're doing if people aren't aware of what they're doing they can't change it it's going to be a lot harder because they're still fighting with some sort of demon that's distracting them from being able to concentrate on their body or on what's going on and stuff like that. So really important to build awareness. Awareness is key, I find, for everything. Okay, so, uh, and then transitioning skills. 
So if you're transitioning skills, go and do one or two things. If you can go in the tunnel and you can do shufflers and layouts and circles and you can do the two-way dive pool, don't go skydiving and try to fit a three-minute routine into a one-minute skydive. Just go and do one part of that routine, okay? Especially as bigger groups, I find. I find a lot of big groups at, at events and stuff like this, they'll go out and they'll try to um, smash out as much technical stuff in one jump. And eventually at the end of the day, they've pulled it back to what they were doing of one jump, of one, one set, sorry, one set move that they were doing compared to trying to do six or seven moves in the skydive as well. So really just simply is easier, build confidence, go through the stages. And as you go through the day, you can just add more and more and more as the group gets more and more comfortable with each other. Um, head down and stuff. If you're in the tunnel, try to do a lot of, uh, rather than just head down points, I find this a lot. People will do four-way, six-way VFS in the tunnel and they go to the sky and they struggle diving. So practice your diving, okay? Um, practice carving, that helps as well. You can learn all this in the tunnel as well. It's just as long as you kind of try and figure out the relation between what you will use that in the sky and you'll just might have to break that down a little bit more and just have a little bit more thought about it. So I rushed through that a little bit quick, but I'm sure I think I took up the same amount of, of the proper time as well. So if anyone has questions, guys, on anything with this, please let me know as well. I'll try to find the chat. Um, no questions yet, uh, Mason. <clears throat> No worries. Look at that. Cool. So that's a compliment from Tom. And also I learned uh, quite some interesting uh, things. Um, <clears throat> uh, Mason, the two videos you mentioned, the one on the on the drift, uh, drift and the putts, yep. if you yep. can send the link either to Grim or to uh, get it, that would be no nice worries. because I would include them uh, in the write-up of, uh, of the session. Yeah, cool. We'll do. Yeah, the, the drift one I find makes a, a big difference like i think the video goes for about half an hour and so does the gear one goes for about 20 minutes as well so i go in depth about all sorts of things the rises coming off pilot shoots and you can actually see what i'm talking about rather than just watching my face and doing these kind of things um same with the spotting the, the spotting i find is the thing that makes the biggest difference these days in free flying is knowing the fall rates of groups Mm -hmm. and the drift with the winds um that's the thing i've i've noticed the most in in uh doing all these events and stuff like that it can have the biggest impact people track off like they're meant to and then getting accused of flying up jump run afterwards um just because they're not really necessarily aware of where the winds are putting them and all sorts of things like this so maybe tracking groups should get out first or maybe last or in the middle and all sorts of things like that so yeah Cheers, guys. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Yeah, yeah, Mason, thank you. But there was one quick question. Somebody had yeah. uh, what your opinion was on a hacky with a tuck tab. Great. Yeah, tuck tabs are good. You can have a hacky with a tuck tab. Uh, I find anything just with a tuck tab just to keep in a little bit. It not, doesn't necessarily matter with a ball, I find. It's just to be a bit more secure. So you can have like the, the old bit of tubing and then have the tuck tab in there, I guess. I don't know how you design that, but I'm sure that would work. It's just... So if something is in there that little bit more, it's just so if you're sit flying or something like that, you can't have the hacky slowly kind of weaseling its way out and then flying off. So the tuck tab is what makes a difference. It isn't necessarily what's on the end of the pilot chute. It's that it's tucked in and nice and secure. Okay, Mason, thank you. It's really interesting. I see a lot of uh, praise in the, in the comments. I think uh, you uh, earned some extra followers for your channel. So uh, thanks a lot. And uh, well, maybe meet uh, each other on a drop zone somewhere. Yeah, fingers crossed I can get back to Europe sometime and all this uh, lockdown and Rona stuff finishes for everyone. And um, we can actually get back to some sort of, not so, sort of normality for everyone and start socializing again and jumping with each other would be awesome. So yeah. And <laughs> more silly, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Mason. Thanks, Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.